Give me a second. I'm starting the show. No, oh uh, yeah. What? <laughs> My camera. Y'all give me a second. Peace, peace, everybody. <clears throat> Y'all uh, help me share the show. Peace, brother. Uh, peace, uh, she is simply unique. Uh, peace, uh, brother Zane. Peace, peace, peace. Uh, Gala S, uh, uh, SC. Peace, LB. Peace, uh, Julanda. Uh, Zachary. Peace, sister. Y'all help me share the show. Y'all, I'm tired. I'm, I don't even feel like sharing the show. I don't even feel like talking. Uh, we finna jump into the show, man. We jump into the show. I was trying to share it, man, but I don't even feel like, like I said, doing that. Let's see. Well, I'm gonna share one more, and I'm gonna call it a day. But yeah, share the show, man, with people you think may be <clears throat> interested uh, in the information. Gallery mode. All right. Oh, you banned on Facebook? Wow. What you done done, Sister Juju? What you done done? Always oh, then. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but you know, uh, but let's get on into the show, man. Let's get on into the show. All right. Am I showing y'all back there or is it Sean Big Face showing back there? Okay. First, I want to say ETM Hotel, do I, do I, ooh, do I, aku, do I, nature, fatmu, alafiye, fatmu, iwa, pele, majuba, iba, i, ilakba, majuba, iba, i, ilakba, majuba, iba, i, i, gungun, majuba, iba, i, i, gungun. I always want to get honor and praises to the ancestors because without the ancestors, we wouldn't be here. We are our ancestors. So I always want to get honor and praises to them. I also want to get honor and praises to the true uh, and living ancestors out there. They know who they are. We don't have that many in this community. But peace to, the, to those, to those elders. Um, Sean, you still on here or you done, you done walked away from the laptop? Man, what am I trying to do? I think Sean, he's on here, but he done walked away from uh, his laptop. Let me share my screen. Hold on, let me turn my camera off too. All right. Let me know if y'all can see my 
PowerPoint on the other side. And also, y'all, um, in the chat, let me know if I get a little choppy or anything. My internet service is garbage. Peace, Mario Foster. Peace, Rakim77. Spoke to everybody else in there. All right. I can see it on the other end. All right. Today's presentation is called Why Animals Are Important in African Culture, Part 1. Um, this is Part 1, a part, a two-part series. Today, this evening, I will be doing Part 2 on Kofi Paisa TV. I'm doing one on the Masi Warrior Clan. And then, like I said, part two will be on Kofi Paisa TV this, uh, this evening. Again, it is called Why Animals Are Important in African Culture, part one. I always have to put a disclaimer out here before I get started. I am not a teacher, but merely a student sharing information. That information provided is for the educational purpose only. And if you are in doubt, do the research and have it verified by someone qualified. I reserve the right to change the focus of this presentation to shut down, sell, or exchange the terms or use in my own discretion. All trademark, design rights, copyrights, residence names, models, logos, avatars, and sigmas, and marks used or cited by this website or the property of their respective owners. I reserve the right to add information as it comes available and or adapt changes, improve information as it comes available in the future. Inputs wanted, changes, additions, deletions are encouraged. Hold on, y'all. All right. This is my saying. I believe in this saying. I believe it's a powerful saying. As I learn, we all learn. We should be sharing information, accurate information of that with the family. As we learn things, we should be able to pass that information down. Let's get this culture is another one of my saying. This is also to me another powerful statement. Let's get this culture because a lot of us don't understand our culture and our tradition have lost our culture and our tradition. Our culture and traditions have been hidden, for, hidden from us for many years. So we as the Masi Warrior Clan, as well as Kofi Paisa TV, as well as the Seshu Ma'ani Meta Nature, we're going to uh, share the culture, our culture. All right. All animals are sacred in African religion tradition. All animals are sacred in African religious tradition. They play vital roles in the creation of the heavens, the earth, and the people. They bring messages of life, death, social order, customs, and practices. Some are regarded as deities, wherever others represent deities are. On the practical level, animals provide food for humans and are source of social wealth and standing. Through totem, totems, they also distinguish relationships among members of a particular community. For this reason, the image of animals, whether it be in stories or on textiles, houses, temples, shrines, pots, containers, drums, and sculptures, in part of a sense of a sacred to these everyday and ritual life of a uh, life in Africa. All right, this is the cuckoo, uh, the cuckoo cone. So we know, according to the uh, slide that I gave, uh, animals are used. Uh, throughout Africa for, for, for many and different reasons. They are used for food source. They are used for instruments. They are used for clothing. They are used to cover instruments, to decorate instruments, uh, which we'll talk about in the next, uh, uh, what's the name, what their blood is used for when we talk about ritual sacrifice. Um, but animals are, are used in so many ways. So let's talk about the... the uh, 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 what are they used in instruments? The kuku, the kudu horn. The kudu is one of the largest and most beautiful antelopes in Africa. It is also the origin of the obscure tradition of scouting. All over the world, the elangant spiral horn of the kudu, hollowed out as a wind instrument, are used in a signal horn to uh, call scout camps and training courses together. Kudu horns release a mellow and warm sound that has the ability to add a unique African accent to the music. So here we have a horn here of the antelope. 
and the antelope horn is you, I mean, the antelope horn is used um, as a horn, a horn for scouting, you know, it has a mellow and warm, um, a warm sound um, released from um, the horn. So this is a music instrument from one of the animals. The Kapalo drum, the Kampalo with the, the Kepalogo drum originated from the greater Accra region in West Africa and is also known as the ceremony drum because of its excellent ability to create sounds that carry over long distances. That's why, you know, in my presentation, I said that African uh, drums is the first form of communication. It was the first cell phone. So they uh, was able to perfect the sounds in the drums where the drums were able to travel long distance miles at a time with some of the some of these drums. Um, because of its excellent ability, created sounds that carry over long distances, the Kepolobo rhythm are often used as a, a way of communicating between tribes and family groups. In the traditional Ghana um, distended barrel shaped peg drum, it was the antelope skin. So here the antelope skin was used to cover uh, the surface uh, or the top piece of the drum. So this drum, uh, um, here is the uh, Copolo drum with the antelope skin on top of it, another animal. The Bagabobo, the Bagabu uh, drum, this drum originated with the Jolo people in the southern uh, Casamas. It is a long slender drum with cow and antelope skin. So here this drum has on the surface uh, at the top, it has the skin of a cow animal or the antelope, either or. This drum has a rich tone of deep bass, traditional up to four, or played by one person. Each drum being tuned in a different pitch. All right, all things can be divided into two main groups, the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. There are many kinds of creation in animal kingdoms. I'm gonna say that again. There are many kinds of, create, of, of creatures. There are many kinds of creatures in animal kingdoms, and there is a scientific system for grouping animals into a smaller and a smaller and, and smaller groups that are more and more similar. The animal kingdom is first subdivided into groups called phylums, singular phylums. The phylums are divided into classes, the classes into orders, and so on until we get to the smallest division called the species. So let's go to the scientific classification before we go any further. The animal kingdom is, is split into these different uh, scientific classification systems. So you have, have the animal kingdom, which they talk about the phylum. The phylum is the anthropodic, uh, which I'm not gonna read all these things, but this is the scientific classification dealing with the animal kingdom. So you got the phylum, the classes, as it said in, in my last slide, all the families, genus, species, and common, and common names. So these animal kingdoms is broke up in these different types of classification and insects fall up under the phylum classification in the animal kingdom. I'll keep this up here for a few minutes for those that they want to look at it, we'll move on a little further. All right, origins. Many African stories hold that long, long ago people and animals could communicate and that individuals in some cultures were able to become one with a specific animal. Over time, this ability, this ability and family, like I said, share the show with those that you think that may be interested in uh, this topic and may appreciate this information. Only if they're interested in this topic and uh, will be appreciative of this information. Communicated that as event, in individuals and in some cultures were able to become one with the specific animal. Over time, this ability was lost to most people except for the selected specialists such as hunters, healers, shamans, priests, of priestess. Although communication was no longer possible, reverence remained. Animals, be, animals because of their complex human-like activities, were early teachers of humans. I'm going to say that again. Animals, because of their complex human-like activities, were early, teach, were early teachers of humans. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm reiterating that again because conversations that I have with some people, people think that humans are superior to animal beings, even in some cultures, you know, um, their way of life, that's what they possess, specify that humans are superior than animals. And we can't get anything from animals, but 
we understood that if we observe nature, we can learn all types of things dealing with nature. So we learned from things in nature. We learned from the animals and the insects and et cetera, et cetera. In a sense that humans learn from watching animals behavior. By observing their behavior, applicants were able to discover in-depth information about themselves and their world. These animals then became symbols and their images were used to convey important information. Now here is the remit. It says that our ancestors observed things in nature. They was able to uh, they observe the animals and the insects. They observed their behavior. They observed the animal behavior. So they was learning things in nature. So let's go to the remit culture in Kemet, where the remit uh, looked at looked at certain things and they learned how to build. This is how when we talk about the mastaba or the per digit is what they will call it. These, these were uh, stacked master box, which master box is Arab mean bench, but we talk about the per digit uh, during the period, during the third dynastic period was Zosia and Hemotep began to orchestra uh, 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 and put together the first step pyramid. And this and and but before this was before the step pyramid, they build these mounds, these master box. So and they build them out of mud. We know they went from, from the mud, we went they went from the mud area to the limestone area when they started started to perfect these pyramids uh in, in, in Kemet. So the Egyptians remits learn how to build dirt and mud structures by watching and studying animal, I mean studying ants and termites. So the remits studied and watched the ants and the termites build in mud and they began to build their own structures out of mud and here on this side you have the ant mound where the ant was building out of mud here is the termite mound on the right hand side where the ants were building out of mud People of the Nile. People of the Nile Valley have a deity of language and writings called Jehuti, who represents as a baboon. Baboons have a language consisting of a clicking sound. Perhaps these early inhabitants made this association of language with the baboon based on its on, on their uh, uh, observation. This here is a depiction of Jehuti. We know we see Jehuti as the bird, it is bird, but we, Jehuti also has another form as the baboon. Depiction of Jehuti as a baboon. This is the fourth century, and this uh, is in the British Museum. The monkey. The monkey is used to symbolize mischief, mischiefness and curiosity. Also, if you ever watch a monkey, you will notice that uh, they are humorous social creatures. The monkey also represents comedy and friendship. Another early example of the use of an uh, animal image is along the sand of the South, Af of South Africa, the sand people of South Africa. The paintings of the dying Elon with a zigzag line emanating front from it, depicting the potencies of the Elan, which the sand believed to be the source of their shamanistic power. Another image shows the empty of the Elan bowls, perhaps a crucial indicator that it is the energy released at the point of death, not just death itself that releases this power. The image are painted with a mixture contained of blood of the Elan. Other images depict a combination of the Elan of humans and a bird of a lion and a human. Keep saying Elan. Elan is a spiral hornet African antelope that lives in the open woodland and the grassland. It is the largest of the antelopes. This is the, uh, from Oxford Dictionary. I just wanted to give a definition because it talks about the inland, uh, um, how um, the Shan people in South Africa depicts the, uh, the inland or uh, depicts this uh, antelope. The Elan in the Bushman believe that the most powerful animal of all, it has healing protection and the rain-making powers. Further, they believe that killing at Elan can change weather. 
It also links to the childbirth and often depicts to the leap from cracks to the rocks as a sign to leave or enter the spiritual world. They are often shown as a uh, polychromatic image. Please note, oh, man, I'm not gonna read that. These theroanthropos uh, appears in rock shelters scattered throughout Southern Africa and the overlapping making it difficult to into distinct uh, scenes. These theaters were vital to life of the Sun people because they were a place at which a shaman could gather and communicate information obtained from their experience with, with and as an animal in the spiritual world. The antelope. The antelope symbolize good harvest. Some tribes believe that the antelope is responsible for teaching humans the secret of good farming. The antelope is a widely respected symbol found throughout Africa. Ancient Ramish culture makes extensive use of both animal images and related anthropos. The written language, Metanature, contains dozens of images of animals and birds that act as letters in the writing system. Sometimes they are read phonetically, uh, sometimes they are read autographically. Egyptians or the Ramish deities appear as both animal images and the theo the uh the theater anthropos the sun deities or the nature's ra is shown as the falcon just as the nature haru so even in the writing system they put animals in their writing systems so you can see the itibus bird here you can see the quail chick bird um here uh you can see the rabbit or the wind hare um here you can see the falcon here. So they, the, uh, even in the uh, uh, even in the Ramich culture, they understood animals was important, and animals were in their writing system. The falcon is a bird of strength and aggressive that soars high, like the sun. And with the sun, the falcon would also be drawn with kings to reinforce their godlike power of attribute. The Netrhet Haru is a cow or in earlier times a hippopotamus or water cow, both a little bit more about, we'll get into uh, uh, later on in part two, I'm gonna get into the myths because even in the myths, the animals are recorded in the myths. They are all in the cosmo cosmological stories. They are in their folk tales and they are in their folklore. Animals are in these stories. And I'll talk about the Kikuku, the Kikuyu people dealing with the myth, dealing with the hippopotamus. We'll deal with that uh, in part two, because I'll be talking about the totems and our, um, um, which each ethnic group, and I'll be talking about uh, Going more into the the folklores and the folk tales that's dealing with the uh, dealing with animals. All right, and this here is from the Seen South Wall of Chappelle, and this is Het Haru. And I did a presentation on Het Haru last week in her seven forms. She had different she had different forms beside the form the form that we see as a lady standing in front with uh, a scepter and an unk in her hand and the cow horns and these uh, rated sun or the sun disc in the middle of the a horn on a crown. She was she she was also, this was one of her forms, the cow uh, depiction, as well as other forms that she had. But this is from the scene walls, and for those that may want to interested in, in the seven forms of the hit Haru, go to Kofi Paisai TV and check out that presentation. The scenes of the south walls of the chapel of Hei Haru in the temple of millions of years of Queen Hatshepsut West uh, Waset Thieves. Heheru in her forms is a sacred cow inside the shrine of the queen Hatshepsut, suckling divine milk at the left representing Amun Ra. And I talked about one of the scenes, well, I actually talk about two of the scenes. So again, go to Kofi Paisa TV for the seven forms of Heheru. And I talk about um, the king suckling the cow as well as Heheru's sons suckling the cow and the symbolism and the meaning behind that. Sebek is image. Sebek is an image as a crocodile. 
The crocodile represents the monster that symbolically devours the day, darkness or night. The depiction of the crocodile with a falcon head shows that it is Haru or the sun that is being devoured or uh, doing battle with the forces of darkness. No animals is left out of the consideration for a sacred duty. In addition to the beetles, lizards, chameleons, spiders, snakes, and foxes occupy prominent positions in religious tradition. It was often that the lizard and the chameleon who carried the messages of death into the world, spiders are, had, spiders are held to be wise. And one of the titles of of the deities among the Akong and the Shantis of the great spider, which we know as Anansi, the wise one. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to show you some images of the beetle, the lizard, the chameleon, the spider, the snake, and the foxes, and I'll give you one of the folklores, which I'll give you more on part two, but we'll talk about the chameleon a little bit, and we'll talk about the spider and the lizard. Here is the dung beetle here. Here is, the, here is the dung beetle rolling dung. The kepra, the ever becoming netra, the image of the dung beetle. The dung beetle buries its eggs in the cow dung. After the annual flood of the Nile, the egg hatches starting a new cycle of life. Out of the less than the ideal setting of the dung or and the flood, life is still ever coming. We know uh, Ra, is. this is one of Ra's form, Ra, as the kepro, uh, the kepro, I mean, Ra as the dung beetle or the scattered, as they were called up in the rich culture. Ra will be kepro in the morning. Um, and here again, uh, the kepro of uh, the dung beetle rolling the dung. Here is the African uh, chameleon. And I shared this story with uh, in my Kikuyu presentation that I did on birth and uh, according to what they do, their birth rituals and their death, death rituals. And I shared this story. This story is also in their cosmology. As I stated, our animals are all throughout African culture and they are all in their cosmological stories as well as their folk tales, their folklores, their myths, and et cetera. So, the Kikuyu African chameleon. This, the Af the uh, a popular uh, uh, Kikuyu tale holds uh, that the long ago Igayo messenger Igayo is the deity of the Kikuyu people, not Yahweh, not Jehovah, uh, but Igayo. And we know uh, that Kenya was flooded with missionaries. We know Kenya was flooded with missionaries, and most of those people in Kenya now are Christians are calling themselves Jews now because of the missionary who came in and set up schools and et cetera. But we're talking about their traditional uh, practices before they was converted and colonized and before the missionaries came in and re-educated them. Long ago, Gaio messengers, the chameleon, had been sent to relay the very simple phrases but extremely important messages that a man would never die. So a guy, the deity or the creator, has sent the messenger. Again, in the slide before, it says that the chameleon and the lizards and some of the African folklores and tales are considered to be messengers. So according to the Kikuyu um, cosmo cosmological story, as the creator begins to send the chameleon, this chameleon animal, out to, to spread that man or mankind would never die. However, chameleons was too slow, and Igayo perhaps eager that the people should receive quickly the good tidings, dispatched a second messenger. So he said, and we know birds are also messengers. We know we, uh, storks are considered to deliver mess messages, etc. The bird, the uh, Iya Medigi, for unknown reasons, the bird corrupted the original message. Man would die and perish forever like the roots of the myth mythical Mugungu planet. This may help to explain why chameleons is not a very pop, very popular in the Kikuyu folktale character. A and it is not popular in their culture according to this mythological or this folklore has been told. A common deaf superstition related to an owl hooting near the homestead 
or perching in, uh, anywhere within its compound. This, this is taken as a omen of intimate death within that homestead. In the past, this requires purification, but to contemporary time, it is enough to just hurl objects at the bird to drive it away. Here is an African agami lizard. Here is the huntsman spider. And I'm gonna tell a story of the lizard and the spider. The spider, we know we look in Ghana, we, 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 there's numerous stutter, stutter, stories about Enunsi, Enunsi the spider. So we're gonna talk about a story, a Ghana story or folklore or folk tale in Africa about this spider and this lizard. So according, and again, like there are numerous stories that's dealing with the spider or Nancy. And we know some of the stories that's dealing with a Nancy in Ghana, uh, Nancy is a trickster, right? So the lizard, this lizard, and well, let, let's just go back in Ghana, this particular story deals with a Ghana king and this Ghana king had three daughters. And the three daughters that this Ghana king had, no one, no one knows the name of this Ghana king's three daughters. And one day the king put out um, that if anyone uh, knows the name of his three daughters, he will give his three daughters hand in marriage to the person who knows the name of his three daughters, which no one knows the name of these uh, his three daughters. So Anansi heard, Anansi heard of this uh, uh, um, this that uh, the king, the Ghana king, put out. So Anansi wanted the name and wanted, I mean, wanted to get the name and married these three daughters. So Anansi grabbed some honey and went and found this fine fruit tree where these three daughters would be bathing it. And he put honey all over this finest fruit, uh, according to the story, and dropped the fruit from the tree as if the fruit fell from the tree. So one of the uh, king's daughter ran toward the fruit and bit the fruit with the honey on it. And she was so pleased by the fruit with the honey on it. So now Anansi was hiding in the tree as he dropped it. And she, the, one, the daughter thought it, it just the fruit just fell from the tree because the fruit was high up in a tree. So the daughter called the name of one of her sisters. And the sister came over and bit the fruit. And then she called on the name of another sister until Anansi had the name of the king's daughters. So now he got with men and assembled a meeting for the next day to be with the king, according to the folklore. This is the Kiku, or not the Kukuyu, but the Ghana um, folklore tale surrounding Anansi uh, and, the, and the lizard, the African lizard. So Anansi went to his friend, the lizard, and told his friend, the lizard, about what he did and the name of the three daughters. And he wanted him to come after he meet with the king with his horn and and pronounced the name of the three daughters for him. So according to the story, then Anansi the spider met with the uh, king of Ghana and he reminded the king of what he said. He will give his three daughters hand in marriage to whoever knows the name of his three daughters. So Anansi called on to his lizard friend and his friend begins to play the name of the three daughters. Now, the king did not give the, the children to, I mean, his daughters hand in marriage to Anansi the spider, but he gave it to the lizard because the lizard pronounced the name and not Anansi. So Anansi was mad and upset. He wanted to get revenge. So Anansi got revenge on the lizard. The, the lizard married the three. Anansi was traveling out of town, according to the story. He went to the king, and the king had a cop. They would always get the king up uh, early in the morning for specific things that he had to do. So the king, according to the story, landed, I mean, told uh, that it uh, lended him the cock so the cock could wake Anansi up to go early out on his, his travels. So Anansi kidnapped the, the, uh, kidnapped the cock, killed the cock, 
cook the cock, pour boiling water into the mouth of the lizard so the lizard mouth would be numb, and went to the king and told him that he was late for his trip to cock. So they went out looking for the cock, couldn't find the cock, and Anansi told him, because Anansi wanted revenge now on the lizard because the lizard gave the name, and it was his plot. So now the king found a hand of some particular, I can't remember exactly according to the story, but it was something of the cock, uh, part of the cock's body in the hand of the lizard while he was asleep with his three wives. And the mouth, that the water, boiling water that he pulled in the mouth numbed the mouth for the lizard where the lizard could not speak. This is why, according to some myths, when you see the lizard, the lizard is always, you know, it's, is shaking his head. Yes, you know, this is just according to the myth. This is why the lizard does what it does. But anyway, so the uh, the wise were taken away from the lizard and the lizard was thrown into jail for being a thief and the wise was awarded to a Nazi. And this is according to the folklore story uh, with the Ghana dealing with the lizard and the spider. But the snake, the snake is thought to be an immortal in many societies are represented in the departed of the living dead. For that reason, specific types of snakes is a physical world world, and are not harmed. If they appear in dreams, they are being, bearing a message from the ancestors. And if drawn, or drones are shown, consuming their tail that symbolizes eternity. With animals giving such prominence in spiritual and sacred matters, they become archetypes of their Im um, uh, Im imagery, uh, imagery uh, pre premature entire culture. When the family or clans have a special or spe specific relations with a particular animal, it is expressed in the form of an animal totem. And we'll talk about more about totems in part two. Common applications of totems include a prohib prohib prohibitations from eating or hunting the animal, the use of the image on the garments of ritual clothing, walking sticks, pots, the use of its image on garments, ritual uh, clothing, uh, walking sticks, pots, and statues, and shrines in the uh, in and expressions of the totem. Here is the bat ear fox. This is a, uh, a fox in the African uh, savannah. Here is the pale fox. And a lot of us may be particular with the pale fox if we have studied uh, the Dogon uh, in Mali uh, and we have studied their culture and dealing with the pale fox. And this is one, and I'll just give, this is one of the totems of the, um, of the Dogon tribes. And in certain, uh, in, in certain uh, groups, these animals, are held to the highest stature. And again, these animals are also in their cosmological stories as well as their myths, their folklores, uh, and etc. Okay, among the Dogon, the pale fox, the Ogo, rebelled against his create creator, attempting to steal seeds of creation, and in doing so, introduced disharmony into the universe. The resulting symbolism of the fox in the Dogon culture is diverse, abstract, and highly sophisticated. The fox is rendered by a simplistic outline drawing of his body and is found in the totem sanctuary and caves throughout the Dogon culture. So they hide, held the pale fox um, up and it is uh, one of their totems and they're uh, all throughout um, the Dogon culture. However, symbolically paraphernalia of the fox can be encountered in children games, basket drums, and their divination table. The leopard. The leopard was also very significant to the Sh uh, Shoni people in Zimbabwe, especially uh, the uh, Mayika. It was a taboo to kill a leopard, which also had the status of being a royal game. Their skins are very important among the, Shon the Shonen and um, that only re owned traditional healers and traditional leaders could put the leper skin on. We see this in the Ramich culture as well. I think it's with the uh, the hymnet, the uh, those priests that wear that leper skin. They were said to be killed only and only when the chief or the traditional leaders wanted the skin. This is the only time that the leper could be killed. Other than that, it was forbid to kill uh, a leper. 
their hunter was supposed to be given permission to kill the leopard by traditional leaders without which it could not be killed. Thus the leopard could be preserved and protected and ensured safety in those rare species. The lion is another animal which is significant in the Shoni traditional society. And this is a uh, Shoni people in East, uh, in East Africa. Uh, and as such a preserved as well as protected. Lions are also regarded as a royal game, as well as the leopard on the, uh, on the other slide. They are considered as a medium of the Shonim ancestors who are the guardians of the land. Seeing the land was said to be a sign that the guardians of the land will be touring around the land as an assurance of the security of the land and its people. Likewise, the lion was not supposed to be harmed as that would extract severe suffering for either or offend uh, or the whole shaman community or even both. The use of animal images in dance, it is understood that all dances forms started as a sacred ritual. The movement in dance were often uh, Potomically inactive of animals such as birds, fishes, while while the dancers is experiencing the movement internally, and it is uh, abstract images of the animals to those watching and dancing. So the ancestors, you can see, they emulated the movement of the animals and created dances from the movement of the animals. Here are my sources. I didn't want to make draw this uh, presentation out too long. This evening I have part two, but first I wanted just to give y'all uh, um, some of the information dealing with the animals, far as um, excuse me, y'all, of what uh symbolically uh the animals represent for us is dealing with some of the uh, folklores or the folk folks uh the folklores or their cosmology and what uh certain animals are represented in certain cultures far as with the shawnee people uh with the kikuyu uh um um, um people and other ethnic groups what the uh antelope uh the lion uh the chameleon um the spider, um, how our ancestors observed animals and began to build structures out of mud, observing animals and other different things. So I just wanted to share some of that information on how, and even how the remit and how they use the animals in their writing system. So animals are very important in African culture. I give you a summary of part one and part two and explain how important it is, how more important it is in African culture when we deal with part two later on this evening, or how important it, our animals are in all societies, how important it is over here for animals. We how we you know what we use animals for. So in part two, I'll deal with I'll deal with um uh, uh totems, you know, uh what animal is specific to what ethnic group. I'll deal with uh, the rituals for as animal sacrifice because we know we sacrifice animals, what the blood is used for. And I'll give a video from Brother Ben who actually breaks down the blood, what the blood represent in African culture and what it, you know, what it does transferring energy. But we'll, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get into that um, um, in part, in part two. And it's something else that I, I deal with in part two. So again, I hope y'all appreciate uh, the information um, on uh, why animals are important in African culture, part one. And I hope y'all will be back later on for part two on Kofi Paisa TV at 6 uh, p.m. I'll leave my uh, sources up here for a minute. Uh, June money. So I'm looking now to see if anybody got any. Sean, you 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 ever come back on here, man? Or you 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 still away from your computer? Sean might be still away from his computer. I know he was at work. Man, don't tell me where I'm at. <laughs> Bye, man.
You got anything, man? I know it's different African tribes were represented by different types of cows and bulls, ooh, bulls and stuff. No, man, I was listening. Even when you was talking, asking me stuff, and I ain't respond, I was listening. Oh, so you was ignoring me, basically, what you were saying. That's what you're saying. Pretty much. If I just be quiet and let you go into the building, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) I know what I'm doing now. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just looking in the chat, man, saying... I think that people South Sudan use cow dung as a manure. Yes, and we'll get into uh, cow dung as manure for fertilizing the land. Uh, according to their tradition, they said it spits in the bones of anything with a grind. Yeah, uh, the phone people highly regarded the snakes, the serpents in their culture to uh, the serpent deity Dan. Also, in the Remich culture too, and I'll talk a little bit more about the serpent too in part two. Uh, I show you certain imageries that's dealing on the wall uh, in Kemet and how important the snake was in Kemet as well as in their uh, neither world stories, which I'll touch briefly on the neither world stories because I don't know when. Um, and I'm I was gonna start, but I, I'm I'll, I'll talk about that uh, later on. But I'm gonna do something on the Book of Gates, and I'm gonna go into those different hours. And in those different hours, you will see that the serpent is there in almost every one of those hours. Um, that Ra is in the the uh, Dua or the neither world or in the underworld as he travels in the West, uh, travels in the West. So uh, I don't know when I'm gonna do that presentation, but um, we'll um, but I'll touch a little bit on that in uh, in part two later on. I got a question. Since you, you're talking about since you're talking about a pep being in every in every hour of the Dua. Is that to say that it's fit chaos is always present? Yes, he, he's always fighting off, off, uh, fighting off chaos. He's always fighting off evil. And even in according to the Remich, uh, one of the Remich stories, you know, when you when when uh, uh, the uh, what is it, a pep, the over, I mean, Ra and the overthrowing of a pep, you know, where Ra. Is going in and set is with him, helping him to uh, fight a pet, fight off evil, fight off chaos. And it was even said that in this in that story that a pep, uh, this uh, serpent was um, influencing mankind. And this is why Ra son Sekmek to destroy uh, mankind because of a, uh, because of a pet. And uh, Ra will fight a pep off. Uh, Every night, as he travels to the uh, travels into those twelve domains or into those twelve hours before Ra rises, uh, for Ra rises, for Kipper rises again uh, in the uh, in the east. All right. So, with that being said, since a pimp is always appearing, is it is it safe to say that the Shimsu Heru research team is acting more like Ra? <laughs> yeah, we, you could say. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to kick some facts here. You know what I mean? Go ahead. I just want people to understand that what you, based on what you just said, when you're dealing with the uh, the Book of Gates, and then when you're dealing with the throwing of uh, the uh, riding the throne of a pep. When you're dealing with them two, just them two, we can get some more in there. But when you're dealing with those two stories, does it not seem like somebody's trying to correct things and stay in the truth, then create, then then get caught up in the midst of chaos and is fed? And when it presents itself, when a pep uh, presents itself, they're able to stave this off. And I think we're witnessing this in real time right now. So that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Mm. We're actually, we are actually witnessing the overthrowing of a pep for the last few years. That's all I got. You know, I just want to sprinkle, sprinkle some game in there. That's all. I ain't look at it like that. So you just broke it down like that, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anybody else got anything, man? Yeah, like like the show, share the show, man. Again, like I said, share the show with those that you that may appreciate um, 
this uh information uh and i appreciate we got 26 people in here man y'all please like the show share the show if you're just uh coming on for the first time please hit that notification bell so when we go live um you uh, uh you know you can get the notification and you won't miss some of these shows um that we do every sunday so um um i hope you know those that are watching come back for part two because i got more information so I wanted to break it up and then put it in all in one presentation. So I wanted to break it down into two parts. So we're going to go a little bit more deeper uh, into why animals are important in African culture. But with this presentation, I know y'all kind of got the logistics of why animals are important, not only just in Africa, but animals are important everywhere. And hope in this uh, presentation here, you can um, get over um thinking that um animals are inferior to human uh, uh, human beings when through uh time and memorial in the beginning of time <laughs> we learned so much from animal animals we imitated animals you know what i'm saying we learned how to build uh like i said mud structures from animals we learned how to do certain techniques uh as far as hunting with animals and i'll talk about that no, I, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in my next presentation, which will lead into the presentation that I'll do next week. I'm presuming on Kofi Paisa TV, um, uh, which will be a nice, nice presentation, too. I'm excited about this presentation, but Kofi, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. You still there, Sean? He must have got panelists. Oh, he he done got kicked off. Okay, there you go, Sean. You still on here? Yeah, I'm right here. Oh, okay. I didn't see you. You, you were saying something. You, you. I wasn't saying nothing. I was just saying, you know, we still alive. I'm oh. done. Though. I ain't got nothing else, man. You know oh, saying? okay. Okay. All right. Well, man, fam, that's it, man. Like I said, I hope y'all come back um, at 6 p.m. to Kofi Paisa TV for part two of this presentation. Um, that me was something else I wanted, wanted to say. Forgot what. But anyway, uh, we'll see y'all then, man, for part two of why animals are important in African culture. Um. Man, I can't even move. Oh, hold on. Let me see something yeah. going on. Okay. Um, we'll be back for part two. I want to say do I do I do I do I do I do I Uh I want to say Shem uh, Imhotep. Shem Imhotep just means to, to depart uh, in peace. Uh, I want to say Black African Power family. And we'll see y'all at 6 p.m. for part two. History is a clock that people use to tell the political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography and where they are what they are.